Hello and welcome back to the Across the Pod NFL podcast for our next team season preview, which will be the Denver Broncos. And for part one, as you can see with me today, I've got back with us on the show, Broncos fan, Charlie Grace. Charlie, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. So, hope we can get into preview in there. Should be an interesting season. Absolutely. And part two should be coming up in the next um, well, second half of this episode uh, with Talk Sports Tony of Folk. Looking at um, sort of the main off-season ins and outs, I mean, looking at the main ins, you know, Josh Reynolds comes in, Cody Barton, Levi Wallace, Brandon Jones, as well as the likes of draft picks are just 12th overall pick, Bo Nixon, um, 36th overall pick, uh, Joan uh, Ellis, 102nd overall pick, wide receiver Troy Franklin, 145th overall pick, Chris Adams, um, 147th overall pick in running back, Audric Estime, 235th overall pick, Devon Velle, wide receiver, as well as 256th overall pick centre in Nick Gar- Gargiolo, Gargiolo, I should say, it's quite a hard one to pronounce. Um, the, and the main outs include Josie Jewell, Adam Troutman, Justin Simmons, who amazingly is still a free agent, Caden Stearns, as well as the main one, Russell Wilson. Um, Charlie, overall for you, um, your take on your team's off-season? Yeah, I think it's been, um, there's been ups and downs. I think obviously, the, the main piece of business was, was the quarterback, kind of getting rid of Russell Wilson and um, getting Sean Payton, his guy, in the draft. Whether it was, you know, all the noise that we had about JJ McCarthy going into it, um that was like the kind of guy that everyone was touting that he wanted as kind of ball of clay but i think they've ended up landing on the better option in bo nix and i think i'm I'm quite excited about bo nix in the sense that all the things you hear about at training camp are quite positive so far um you look at his tape from oregon he seems tailor-made with his experience the amount of snaps he's played the amount of games he's played college football to, to kind of run that Sean Payton offense can can stand in the pocket but can also extend the play outside the pocket as well um if needed to and um yeah I'm excited to see what Bonitz can bring to this team. Um and yeah like I said obviously the main piece of business up front was getting rid of Russell Wilson and designating that as a post June first cut even that happened in March I think it was so that ended up spreading the the cap hit the largest in NFL history across two seasons instead of it hitting us all like a train this season, um, which allowed for a bit more movement in the off season, which obviously like you just explained, brought in, you know, some, some players that could play quite key roles in a roster that you'd say looks a bit bare boned at the moment. Yeah. I mean, Russell Wilson, I mean, it's, um, I don't think anyone expected, what's happened, what really happened those two years in Denver, really when you know, the, the news broke of the trade for Russell Wilson, we went from Seattle to Denver. It just, ha- it just it's just been a, com- I wouldn't say a complete disaster, but it's not been at all, is it? wasn't at all what you thought you were getting when you made all those, gave away all those draft picks to get him. Yeah, I, th- I think there, there were certain indicators to say that he was past his best um, in his last season at Seattle. With the you know the thumb injury that he had, I think sustaining later in the season that year, um, but there's nothing to suggest the kind of car crash that's been since, um, especially given how much we gave up for him. I think part of that down to Nathaniel Hackett last year that you know I don't think that was the right coach in hire. The system didn't work. That was all kind of geared towards bringing Aaron Rodgers. To Denver, I think more than than Russell Wilson, but um, you know we'll, we'll get into a bit more later. Last year he looked better. He he was definitely markedly improved from from twenty twenty two. That would be, but I mean that wasn't necessarily hard. Um, and I think, but yeah, I I think it was inevitable that they were going to move on. You know, you saw kind of. The last couple of weeks of the season, when Jarrett Stidham came in instead, um, it, it just seemed like Russell Wilson's race was run, and I think it was better for all parties to just kind of cut their losses and move on to to new things. Um, 
and it will hurt the Broncos more than Russell Wilson in the in the short term. But I think it was definitely the right move. Um, it's it's just crazy to me that he never played. You know, he got his mammoth extension kind of what a month after he signed because we 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 took him on as a the remaining two years of his Seattle contract, and we've ended up cutting him before we even got onto the the contract extension that he signed. It was a five year extension worth an obscene amount of money, which his play didn't didn't play up to in the end. Yeah, it's it's you know it's one of those things where you know all the hype I mean we had a bit of Aaron Rodgers but that was more because of injury but you know it's not the first time that big stars come in, big hype and then it's it's not worked out. This comes from any sport and it's just I just think I don't know whether it just even more just proves how good Pete Carroll was or just how much more downturn Russell Wilson was on, the fact that how bad he looked in Denver compared to Seattle. But yeah, I mean, I think it was, for me ultimately, I think the right, the right decision was to get rid of him because I just feel like, especially with the Sean Payton factor, and they didn't really, I don't think we saw eye to eye, and Sean Payton obviously has gone down a new route. And, you know, looking at, we had planned to talk about the, the callback room. I mean, looking at the... um the, the news today and looking like Jarrah Stittums, the current named number one starter in Denver, which um, I don't think anyone had, you know, Dan, I mean, everyone thought it'd be one of Zach Wilson or Bo Nix, but looking at the uh, Pro Football Talk report, they're saying that at the moment, um, Bo Nix is number three and Zach Wilson is number two with uh, Jarrah Stittum as a starter. Now, you know, we've seen it before, let's talk about it with... Um, Drew Locker with Eugene Smith in Seattle, I believe. Uh, there's been talk of it before. There's been some bit of smoke between sometimes with teams and then they end, they end up starting someone else or someone else just in, the, in, the, in the last couple of weeks of training camp or practice overshines them on maybe a preseason game. But did that shock you at all? The fact that it is going to be, um, at the moment, it looks like Jarrett Titton is going to be the starter for you? Um, it wouldn't shock me too much, I think, more because stidham has been there now another year. So he he obviously had last year learning the playbook. Spent a couple of weeks in that in that offense as well in the last couple of weeks of the season. Um, and I I don't think you'd want to throw Bo Nix into the fire straight away, even though he is obviously the the most experienced rookie. But I think Sean Payton's one of those an older school head coach that's gonna a bit like Andy Reid did with Patrick Mahomes. He'll sit him for the majority of this year so he can learn. The Broncos got a late buy this year, the week 14 buy, so more or less as late as it can come, which which benefits Bonix's development. Um, I think placing him third on the depth chart is more of a possibly a, a mind games thing for Sean Payton is trying to motivate him to, you know, initially just set your sights on beating Zach Wilson in the depth chart. Don't set your sights, you know, too high. Going for a starting role straight away. You've only just come into the league. You've been in the league, what, all of about four months since the draft. So, you know, don't get too ahead of yourselves. Get this, the backup position first. Get reps in preseason. And then as the season goes on, start to look at catching Stidham up. Because um, we're, we're not in any kind of race to, to make the postseason this year, I think. No one's under any illusion of that, so it's it's more a, a year of of regrouping, seeing what you've got, um, in in the franchises, in the roster, and then we'll we'll go from there, building on next season, next off season, and and look to build on what we have this season, with Bo Nitz getting a year of experience under his belt. Joe, you know, I find the whole quarterback rookie quarterback dynamic so interesting because, on the one hand, you've got Zach Wilson, obviously now a Bronco. I mean, he was thrust into the into the fire straight away in New York and never really given a chance. And ultimately, you know, he didn't get that time to t- sit back and learn initially. And in the end, but then on the flip side, you got CJ Stroud, who came in and pretty much straight away was lights out. And you know, no one thought that Texans would make the playoffs, let alone win the division, even win a playoff game. So I think it, it, it's a number of factors for me. I think there's 
I think ultimately it comes down to the player and mentality. I think this Stroud seemingly has a great mentality, uh, but also I think the weapons around him, you know, you've got like to have a bad tank, Dell, Nico Collins, uh, Dalton Schultz, whereas um, I think outside, outside of Court and Sutton, I don't think the weapon room is awfully great in Denver. I could be wrong on that. I may have missed someone out or forgotten about someone. Um, but or Josh Reynolds is, is a underrated serious ball wide receiver two or three, but um, maybe Stroud was lucky the fact that it's a much easier division. I think um, I'd much rather go up against those, te- those three teams in the AFC South, albeit they're improving, than fake likes of Max Crosby or Chris Jones or um, maybe Joey Bosa, even though he's over the hill a little bit. But um, yeah, so I think, I think personally, CJ C- C- Stroud might have been an outlier because you think about um, really... The last three players to win MVP in Aaron Rodgers, Lamar Jackson, Patrick Mahomes, all three of them sat year one. Well, Rodgers sat for many years. Mahomes sat for the whole of year one. And Lamar Jackson uh, sat for, I think, two thirds of that 2018 season. So um, for me, I think the history has proved, the stats have proved that, yeah, you know, Joe Burrow started week one and Peyton Manning started year one. And, you know, he had a terrible first year, albeit, I think the record suggests and history suggests that. Sitting is the best option because um, the league isn't what have we done for me lately. And if you struggle your first year, um, then you got to, you've got to try and prove it again the following year. Whereas if you have a year off, you've got that sort of get out of jail free car where someone goes, oh, he hasn't played at all. Therefore, we'll give him an extra year. So I think it just allows you time just to sit and learn because no matter which college team you play for, no one is ready for the NFL. No matter how pro ready they say they are on all the all the draft talk and all the all the articles and all the podcasts. You don't know. You don't know. Caleb Williams is number one overall pick. He's going to a seven nine team, which is rare for number one overall pick, but that doesn't guarantee he's going to be good. That doesn't guarantee it. And so for me, I think Bonick sitting him is perfect. And give him that year or two, we even yeah, maybe even two or three years, like Jordan Love had, sit behind someone, I think ultimately works out for everyone involved. Um, and I, I'm glad for Jarrell Stidham because there was times in New England where after Brady left, they were saying he was going to get the starting job and there was a lot. And then each time he got battered down with, oh, we're going to start Mac Jones or we're going to start Cam Newton or whoever it was in the quarterback room in New England. It just, he never really got that chance to play. So I, I'm kind of, for his sake, I want to see him have at least, you know, at least half a season to give himself a chance and then hopefully the whole season because I think that he... Yeah, I think as an NFL player, NFL player, you want to get chances. He's had he's had games. He's played um, as a backup. He's come into games or played in, I think, believe the final week a couple of times where the, the team is resting players. But overall, yeah, it's um, I'm just glad for him that he's getting uh, a chance. And of course, we mentioned Sean Payton then. Um, interesting first year. Let's put it that way. Uh, not maybe not the, the year you were hoping for with Sean Payton with all his new New Orleans Saints reputation but you know he has got a history he's t- he's turned Drew Brees into a what's going to be a first battle Hall of Famer you would think and uh, he did see Russell Wilson improve so for the sense of uh, Sean Payton what are you expecting out of him coming to year two? Um, I think last year was last year he did he did all he could have done I think he made Russell Wilson look fairly competent you know a marked improvement like we were saying on the year before we were in we had a shot at the postseason until about week 16 i think it was um which is you know since the the super bowl victory in in 2016 that's probably the longest we've been in a postseason race um in across that sort of eight year stretch which seems crazy but I think he did as as much as he could have done with the pieces that he had. He shored up the run game. You know, the offensive line looked really good last year. Lloyd Cushenberry went to Tennessee in free agency. It'll be a big loss in the middle of that um, offensive line um, going into year two. So it'll be interesting to see how they adapt to that. But I think he also got us our, our first win against Kansas City and. Uh, something like 16, 17 games. It it was a crazy stretch that dated back even to before we won the Super Bowl, I think. So that was a a, a trend that he, he snapped in his first year, which is kind of a, a big elephant off, off the back of 
with everyone involved with the franchise. Um, I, I think my my one criticism of him this year is he at times was a bit stubborn. Yeah, he, he, sometimes he he'd stay to his script. You know, you could see Russell Wilson wants to get out of the pocket, create plays himself, works well out of structure, and Sean Payton was a bit more like never going to run it first ball kind of up the gut second ball second down sorry we'll we'll um we'll go with the play action kind of across the middle which everyone knows Russell Wilson's weak point is across the middle he can't see over the offensive line so he's not going to see the middle of the field and then when all else fails they just kind of dump it off a, a wide a wide receiver or half back screen that gets three or four yards maybe and then we punt the ball away um and and that seemed like that's what it was for a large stretch of the season, which was frustrating to watch. But I, I think now with the quarterback that he can mould, a young guy that's that's his guy, he's there's reason for optimism going into this year. And like you said, you know, added Josh Reynolds, who's a good additional piece to Cortland Sutton, um, Marvin Mims, quite a good guys to take the top off the defense, kind of a a slot guy who's going to be fairly quick. And then Troy Franklin, who I think is not going to light the league up with kind of Justin Jefferson-esque numbers. I don't even think he's necessarily going to be a tremendous wide receiver two at the level, but him and Bo Nix know each other. Um, and he's he's got a skill set that, that works well in the wide receiver room that we've got. You know, he's not, we don't necessarily have that over the top threat that's going to stretch stretch the the opposing defense other than Marvin Mims but he also returns kicks so he's not playing every down down of the, of a game so i think there's there's a nice dynamic in that that offensive room now and i think there's definitely a foundation that can be laid this year which Sean Payton has set ourselves set us up with because of his performance last year. Yeah, and I think that with um, it was Sean Payton's, really, I don't recall many losing seasons in New Orleans. And, you know, even without Breeze Air, the record was still good with, um, as you've forgotten who was quarterback now after yeah, after James Winston. Had, James Winston, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, I think it's... It's hard to know because from what I saw from our side point of view, he didn't seem to really adapt and change what he was doing. And I felt like there wasn't really much of a plan B I found personally with him. So yeah, that's my only really I think exactly what you're saying, the whole stubborn factor. I, I just think that that was my main concern from an outside point of view. But I just think that with the whole Nathaniel Hackett thing where he was um criticizing him in preseason and you know winding up other teams it's you know it can go one or two ways that kind of tactic and I don't think year one I think especially when the Jets and Hackett beat the Broncos last season I think it was it wasn't a good look for him but I think you know you think about a head coach's season he had I think if he hadn't had if that was his first NFL job I think he'd be a lot more sort of pressure as an NFL head coach but I think I think the fact he's won a Super Bowl kept the basically New Orleans as Super Bowl as playoff contenders and in the playoffs most years he was there, I think that buys him a bit of time. I don't think he's really unless it goes horribly wrong or things so or sort of go Pete Tong behind the scenes and there's some sort of unrest and the players you know, he loses the locker room or something like that. I just think that he's definitely guarantees himself an extra year or two just because of his obvious C V and his resume. And I think that will ultimately be his biggest help if you do finish, I don't know, with six wins, five wins, seven wins, or something like that. So yeah, I think you know, I think he's got record. I think it's, you probably, I imagine you probably think there's not many, many anyone really available that you'd rather have than him because all the good ones are already at teams. You know, Sean McVay, Andy Reid, um, Cal Shanahan, all, all the good ones. So I really, I think you know, with him there, you know, I think he, yeah, there's probably not many you have. Really, instead of him, really, if, if it was to go bad. So I think, yeah, he's he's the guy for the uh, short term, maybe the few years after that. Yeah, I think he, his reputation obviously has preceded him. Um, 
coming into Denver. Um, and like you said, I think that buys him a bit more time. The the improvement that we saw in the team last year, I think, will probably have have meant that the ownership group have seen it as a a fairly, I won't say net positive, but the the franchise didn't take a step backwards last year, that's for sure. Um, so he's come in, he's been the highest paid head coach, I think, in NFL history. They gave him a massive mammoth contract. Um, I know that much. And he's he's now, um, you know, we, we improved last year. And now going into next year, I think it's all about not necessarily seeing progress in the record. We're not going to, what was it, seven, seven and nine we finished last year. I don't think we're going to. We're not winning eight games this year, eight games of football this year, I don't think. Um so you're not going to see progress on that front, but I think you will see progress in the sense of I think but Bo Nix will come out of this year, I, I hope, looking like someone who can carry the franchise forward for the next kind of five years on his rookie deal. Um and they'll be out of the cloud almost of that cap hit that they took from Russell Wilson. It'll hit slightly in, in 2025, but by no means as much as it would have done. You know, if, if they'd either kept him on or if they'd cut him um, as as a pre-June first th- this off-season. So you'll be out of that kind of mire. You've got a QB of the future, and then, and then you look to actually getting winning records and compete for postseason berths in 2025 and beyond. Um, so I think his his um, his reputation, but also the kind of context of the situation he's in gives him gives him a bit of time and lenience to to work how we know he can work in the NFL with his reputation from New Orleans. Yeah, I think I think you're bang on the money there. Um, so we are going to head to our final segment, which is going to be our win loss tie section. So for those who aren't aware of the format, who are listening at home, uh, each fan who comes on the show will predict their team's record by going through each game and answering with a win loss tie prediction. So week one, um, it's a shame Russell Wilson is gone because week <laughs> one would have been or is a road game in Seattle. Win loss or tie? Uh, loss. Well. I mentioned, I mentioned Russell Wilson. You're playing in week two um, at home to Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah, loss again, I think. Interesting. You know, we saw him get booed at, at Seattle um, when he his first game for the Broncos, uh, despite all he did for the franchise. Now, are you expecting anything sort of similar, like sort of reputation-wise or sort of reception-wise from the fans? Do you think they're going to boo him or do you think they'll just be almost glad he's gone? <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. I think um as a caveat, I'm I'm a Justin Fields fan, so you know, who knows? It might be Justin Fields under centre of that game. I don't even know what's going on in Pittsburgh. I haven't seen any kind of indications to who's got the starting role. But um no, I think he he was always his himself in, in Denver in, in a sense of he was the big kind of celebrity personality and he did he did as much in the community as he did kind of talking off the field which stood him in good stead I think locally with with the people of Denver but his performance obviously was never good enough so in that sense people might might jeer him a little bit but I wouldn't have thought it'd be anything to the extent of like what he got when he went back into Seattle as as kind of they're not really booing him like he's a pantomime villain type thing I don't think no, I think as well, I think probably part of the booing he got was probably just because of how good he was in Seattle and just sort of almost the, the shock factor and disappointment of fans that he left because he did so well for them. Maybe, you know, maybe not quite the same. He's only been there two years and not really performing well. Um, week three uh, is a road game, uh, this time against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, I've gone win. Okay. Um, so week four, um, you're on the road. To the New York Jets, loss. Assuming that Aaron Rodgers has 
lasted longer than four snaps <laughs> for that one, I think. There has been a trend of our predictions that it's all sort of almost like an asterisk behind each Jack Jets prediction for each game. Yeah. <laughs> for because you don't know whether he's going to be yeah. helpful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, week five uh, is a home game against the Las Vegas Raiders. I'm going to say win, but I always predict us to win against the Raiders. And we actually haven't beaten them in something like nine straight games, which is... Wow, I didn't realize it was that long. It, That's, it's, um... it's a horrible record that I hope is quashed <laughs> it, it's very to soon. Add, to add that to the, um, that, the Chiefs record we had for, what, 17 games? Yeah. Probably maybe the best time in the AFC West for <laughs> <No>. the fans. <laughs> no, it's um, not. So week six, sticking with the West Coast team, at home again against the LA Chargers. Yeah, I think we win for that one. Okay, well, week seven is the return of Sean Payton to the Superdome as you take on the New Orleans Saints on the road. Win. Okay, um, so week eight, uh, you're back at home, but this time against the Carolina Panthers, win, loss or tie? Win. Okay, so week nine. Oh my! I've just seen the next two games. Oh my goodness! You got a yeah. couple. You gone from one extreme to the other here with your next two yeah, games. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first on the road against the Ravens. Yeah, loss. Yeah. Uh, and then on the road to the Chiefs. <laughs> yeah, ditto. Ditto on the on the loss there. God, the league just hit you. With not, that yeah, not not an easy like mid, bang middle of the season as well. <laughs> couple of injuries in there probably. Yeah. Oh not, God, it's not like, good. It's like it's teasing you with. It's like I imagine it's like um, almost like a a cat trying. Um, I was, this is my memory, my memory because my cat bought in a mouse last night. But it's like a, a cat break, like with a with a vole or mouse. They tease you guys with with the Panthers, and then yeah. you then go on, and they then they attack you with the Ravens and Chiefs on the road. That's um that's horrific. Yeah. <laughs> Both on um, the road as well. Yeah, it's just brutal. Like two tough places to go. To, I mean. Two very loud stadiums um, to go yeah. to. I mean, both are just notoriously. Um, and, you know, I've been to both, and they're just they're just so loud. Yeah. Uh, you, you, many many silent counts. I mean, the Saints is loud enough, but the team aren't that good, so it's all you can get away with. Yeah. It. But um, the yeah, Ravens and Chiefs, that's that's horrific. Um, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but you're back at home week eleven, uh, but this time against the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, I am denial on this one a bit, but I've gone with loss. Just because I think um, I'm a bit higher on the Falcons in sense of you know Kirk Cousins and all those weapons. I think at, at some point they've got to finally come good, right? Like last season, we thought they were going to be good, and then forgot that Desmond Ridder is actually not a very good quarterback. So now they've got a good quarterback, they've got to be good, surely. I think, I think especially their division. It's, an easy, it's the worst division in the league, I think, by some distance. And I think um, that's, you know, I think you've got to think they'll probably be, they'll have to be contending for playoffs by that division. And I think that, you know, with the team they got, you know, I think it's, don't think it's a super winning team, but I think it's certainly a team that can challenge to potentially win one playoff game. I think that's their ceiling. I think maybe at most two playoff games, but I don't see them make an NFC championship game, I think that is yeah. that'd be a real a real stretch. Um week twelve though, you go into Vegas to take on the Raiders. Yeah, we snap the streak and then we double it. We we win again. It's like I'm pretty sure it's the only I know, other than Tampa, it's the only win on the road that I've actually predicted us getting. But um you've got Saints on the road you've got as a win. Oh Saints on the win. Um and Raiders, yeah. yeah. So um yeah, you go. So you go. You got your week fourteen by, but before that, um, you're six yeah. and six going into week thirteen, uh, hosting the Cleveland Browns. Yeah, I think a loss. Uh, you know, it's in prime time as well. I think is it Thursday night uh, game is this I will one. Go and is check it? it now. Um, let me go and check it. I think Mikey it's the Thursday night game. Brown versus Broncos. My spelling is awful tonight. Um. It says one fifteen on December third, twenty twenty four. So that is, um, yeah, Monday Night Football. So, yeah, so 
Perfect time for Jerry Judy to score a walk-off touchdown. <laughs> After oh, trading in there. I actually forgot about that trade. I forgot yeah. about it. Yeah. Going, to, going, to the Bron- going to the Browns via the Broncos. I don't know how yeah. I forgot that because I, uh, on Madden only a month ago, uh, I play on Madden 20. So I tried putting all the new the new um, addition to new signings. To the, to yeah, yeah. I put Judy to, to the Browns and I, yeah, I don't know why I forgot that. Yeah. Uh, that, is all, that is on me. I apologise for that. Um, so, Week 15 is the Peyton Manning Bowl as the Broncos <laughs> take on the Colts. Uh, a win. Because we, we play in first first week of preseason and I think yeah, we'll, okay. we'll get, their, get their number a little bit. Um, but they're one of those teams, you know, they could be hot going into a playoff run with you know, Anthony Richardson. Who, who knows? Especially in, in Denver with his arm, the the thin air, the ball could absolutely fly. So I, d- I don't know what would happen there, but yeah, we've got to be positive, seven. right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's only we got B, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um. So week sixteen, you're taking on on the road the LA Chargers. I've uh, gone with the loss. I think Jim like that Harbour Payton mm. kind of. Um, the mind games and the, the it's always going to be a chess match. I think those two, because we play them early on in the season week week six, and then I think maybe the the char. I think if we win that one, the charge will pick some things up and and maybe just pip us at because they'll probably have playoff aspirations at that point in the season. You'd have thought as well. So at home, I, I can see it going the way of the charges. Unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, we're talking of playoff aspirations. Week 17, you take on the Cincinnati Bengals, who you would think, provided Burrow stays healthy, will be one of the top teams in the AFC at this point. Yeah, and sort of the same with, with the Chargers as playoff aspirations, but you've also got to think, you know, possibly number one seed implications in week 17 at that point. Um, it's a tough place to go again. And I, I think that'd be a loss as well. Okay, so finally, week 18, you're at home to the Chiefs. Yeah, my, my hope is that they've either secured the number one seed or are like locked into number two and they just rest all their players and we can like rack up some points just for, for the fun of it. Um, I've gone win. I'm a bit optimistic wow. there, I think, but I'm, I'm playing some like some mind games in looking into the future. They're resting all their starters, so we'll just, you know, we can breeze it against their backups. But who yeah, knows? Yeah, I, I think at that point they'll be, you would think, unless injury strikes, will probably be certainly locked into the playoffs and uh, maybe even locked into them one seed in the AFC. So I think if that does happen, the, the history suggests, their track record suggests they will rest the starters. So yeah, I think. I believe Carson Wentz is the backup at the Chiefs at the moment, so I think he'll be. Uh, if I'm not saying he'll be the backup, so he'll be starting. Um, should that be the case, which I'm going to check now, I got a feeling it is. Yeah, Wentz, I think so. Which would be, you know, I think for him, I really want. In a way, I've got definitely got motives for them to win a Super Bowl because of Reece Samet. If Dolphins yeah. weren't win it, I think Tavo Welsh and win a Super Bowl would be amazing, um, especially if he gets involved and plays. But I think returning Carson, kickoffs probably. Yeah, I think that could be his way in. Special teams, certainly. Or maybe the Chiefs like to, you know, split receivers so much. You know, I think they could go down that route and, you know, just alternate between. Because they haven't got really any stars apart from Trevor Thomas Kelsey uh, to throw to. So I think they could see a lot of split snaps. But I think with Carson Wentz, I think, I feel so, so I only got a ring with the Eagles, but I felt so bad for the fact that he was so good that year. And then, you know, Nick Foles sort of steals the. Yeah, still headlines in the limelight. So I think, um, for his, I think for his sake, I love him to. What I love is that Mahomes gets injured, not seriously injured, but I don't want to see a player injured. But he goes down in the game, even if it's just one one possession, and Mahomes comes back in. When score, throws for touchdown, I think that'll be just almost a four one eighty. I think a lot yeah. of NFL fans will probably be rooting for that outcome and rooting for him that game, provided their team's not the one playing him. Um, 
So that is an eight and nine record, uh, which you, you would think probably doesn't make you doesn't get you into the playoffs unless there's a, a real cannibalization with teams in the AFC. I I think that probably will be not enough, but I think that's progress. I think go from what we had last year to that. I think it's um step in the right direction. Yeah, I said earlier that I don't think we get eight wins either, so that shows how good my maths is. But um, no, I, I think. A, a couple of those are a bit hopeful picks, I think. But um, a, a lot of our schedules kind of like, and and a lot with the NFL as well, when you're predicting kind of week 15 games, when it gets round to it, you look at your preseason prediction. Like last year, I'd predicted the Jets to be like 12 and 5. And then you get to week week 16. Well, actually, no, you get to the fifth snap of week one and you're like, well, that looks stupid because now Aaron Rodgers is out for the year. So it it changes so quick, the league, that you can't, you know, you, you don't really know what what to expect from week to week, even, you know, week one, some some crazy things could happen between now and then. So that's the beauty of it. And I suppose that's why we're all fools for making predictions, but it's all part of the fun, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Every year you get a team that, was last in their division who goes on to win the division last year that was Texan. We also get teams, you know, who are the media darlings, get so much hype. I mean you had uh, the Broncos in twenty twenty two, uh, the Jets last year where, you know, they're basically they go perform completely under the expectation. And I you know, I wonder who that'll be this year. I don't think it could be the Lions, but I, I think um, you know, it's yeah, it's beautiful, beautiful sport. You know that, you know, we love football, you know, certainly in my household. And, you know, but you know it's going to be one of five, six teams that are going to, are going to be challenging. Well, probably, you know, just one team at the moment challenging for Premier League title. Whereas every year you've got the same teams. You've got, you got the, the Chiefs and the, you know, the Bengals will be there. But you know, 10 years ago, the Chiefs weren't competing. The Bengals certainly weren't competing. The Bills weren't competing. And you look at 10 years ago, the Giants were one of the top teams. The Broncos were when Manning came in. And neither teams won a playoff game, I believe, since... I think the Giants won one since they won the Super Bowl. And Broncos haven't even, haven't even made the Super Bowl since... Yeah. made the playoffs since winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's, that's why we love it. The parity is really good. And I think hopefully it stays that way. But hopefully a different team wins it this year. That's all I'm saying. I'm sure you probably feel the same. <laughs> Yeah, I've been wishing the same for the last two years as well. So, yeah, um, <laughs> maybe a pipe dream at this point, but it should be should be another exciting year. Um, I wouldn't say there's any team at the moment that I'm looking at and I'm saying is a is a clear front runner for any you know division titles or or any Super Bowl picks. So it's it's always a a, a really great kind of. Just watch the season unfold, you know, you see, like last year, it was like the Texans, everyone thought they'll, at some point they'd fall off and they they never did and they just kept going. And then you have teams that have peaks and troughs, you know, a team will come out the gate flying, like start 8-0 and and then end up scraping the playoffs with a 9-8 and record and they crash out the first week. So it's all about how you start, not if, all about how you finish, not how you start. That's the exactly. my favourite phrase in the NFL. <laughs> it's so true, though. I mean, uh, how many times do um, you know? Think of the Cardinals and Steelers in recent years going eight and zero, eleven and zero, respectively, and then you think about the um, Patriots often going four and five, or five and five, or seven and six, or something like that, and then they get good at the end of the year, and then we all know what happened with them all those years in the playoffs. Um, and as well, just you know, we're going to have Sam Moore's on later on in, in the off season uh, with the Dolphins season preview. We had him on um, early on this off season to, to rank quarterbacks once again. Um, I know you're on this course. I believe you, you're going to live with him as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, we lived lived together last year and yeah. then again this year. So you'll be, I'm sure both you'll be having your usual Sunday Sunday evenings watching. Uh, yeah, action. yeah, our little watch part is we got. Owen is another housemate. He watches it on our course as well. And then people from our course come round. So nice little Sunday get together. And generally, I'm really sad at the end of it. And everyone else is happy. But yeah, maybe this year will be different. 
No, I, I'm not going to put your hopes on it. No offense <laughs> to the Broncos. <laughs> um, and as well, like, you know, do you get any of the sort of usual sort of British sort of classic thing in the UK you get where someone comes in, they don't know what the sport is, they, they moan about the stop startiness or the adverts. Does that happen at all? Or is it all all NFL fans that watch it? Um, so there's a couple of, of people who had a bit more of interest in basketball when they started and then you know, just kind of the the involvement in American sport kind of they had an interest in getting involved in it. They watched it with us a bit, but I think soon you kind of get over the once you realise that it's a completely different thing to foot like British sport in general, like when you watch American sport you've got to set your mind aside of what you think sport is. And you're you're watching like a show sort of entertainment more than more than a sports match in some ways. Um and the beauty of NFL Red Zone helps as well. Scott Hansen and his and his Octo box getting you know, instead of having the stop starting this, you kind of always have a bit of action going on there, which helps people get into the game a bit more. Um but but no, it's it's always nice to introduce some new people to the sport, especially with it growing as much as it is at the moment. Yeah, I think about it. I said to people before, I've got friends of mine, even Adam, I was at the Olympics with, Olympics with this week, other friends who always moan about that. But I, I always say that the game actually wouldn't be as good if it wasn't stop-start. I think the way the sport's designed in terms of how each play starts with the ball being snapped from the spine of centre's legs, that just wouldn't work if it was constant flowing because it just the action you know wouldn't work if it you know everyone goes like rugby not being stop start but it's a whole different ball game it's basically like a like laterals in nfl all game long but i think it just wouldn't work i don't think if you had it constantly i mean you get occasional plays i've talked about this before you get the occasional plays where i think the bills did a lot with jim kelly like kagan offense where you know they go for the no huddle no huddle sort of approach but most time few I think the flow wouldn't be as good if it wasn't stop start. If it, I think if that wasn't the case, I don't think it works well. I don't know whether you agree with that or not, Charlie. But I just think that it actually flow is is good as it is. And I think actually it would be worse if there wasn't any stop startiness. Yeah, the, it adds an additional element to it. Of there's the analytical element of it, of course, of of play callers calling up their plays and things. Um, but it also does help you kind of, it focuses the excitement and the energy, of, you know, it boils it down into lots of little pockets instead of, you know, you can imagine, like I often find it with rugby games, I always get a bit disengaged because it's quite chaotic. You know, there's lots of action going on, like there's a, a ruck going on one place and then there's people from a line out still on the floor at the bottom of your screen and you're trying to kind of, work out what's going on everywhere and I think that kind of makes makes it a bit more confusing and chaotic in in a sense whereas in the NFL you have you know you know exactly what you're looking at you know 22 people for all of about eight seconds in a short burst but you know it's going to be exciting and something's going to happen on every snap so you've got to kind of lock yourself in every time that the the whistle goes for them to snap the ball and then it yeah i don't know i think it just helps focus the excitement a bit more and almost helps you engage a bit easier with it because maybe this is my tiktok brain talking but you know the short retention span of just having to focus on like eight seconds of of action and then you can kind of go away from it a little bit lock back in half half a minute later and then you do it all again yeah i think as well i I'm terrible at looking at my phone uh, during football yeah. games. I get so distracted, and so, especially group chats and all that kind of stuff. When I'm watching, I don't know, a Premier League game or Champions League game or maybe a Championship game or something, I, I get so distracted with my phone, whereas I find that I can go on my phone, especially not so much red zone because it's always something going on, but when it gets to the playoff, when it gets to a prime time game, I can just look at it in between plays. I haven't got that thing about, you know, can't touch your phone for an hour because you're watching the first half of this game. I think, I think in a way, I quite like that the fact that um, you, know, you can have that time to look at your phone and come back and still watch the game and not and not missing a thing. Um, so yeah, I, I love that a lot. Um, 
but that is where we'll end the podcast for today so um thank you once again for charlie for coming on thank you for having me um it's been a joy to speak about and hopefully my prediction comes true if it does i'll be jumping for joy i bet i mean it's i mean rather than maybe 10 wins but i think <laughs> progress i think that's quite a good one yeah i mean only what what's that one game below 500 instead of about five which we usually are so <laughs> something to cheer for i suppose yeah exactly and for those of you who have listened to charlie and want to no ball about his stuff. You can follow him on social. For those watching on YouTube, you can see his handle. But for those listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, it is at Charlie G Journal. Do check it out for all his um, uni work, all his journal work, and yeah, all his um, all his content. So do keep an eye out for that. But that has been the Across the Pod NFL Podcast, our Denver Broncos season preview, part one. Let's head to part two. And welcome back for part two of our Denver Broncos season preview. As we did to in part one, we are here with Talk Sports Tony Folk. Tony, how are you? I'm good. Thank you for having me once again. It's that time of the year where we preview the Bronco season and I get too optimistic and then the season happens and I realise how bad we are. But maybe not this year, but we'll talk about that later on in the podcast. <laughs> yeah, we will. We will certainly go through our win loss tie second, which uh, I will be telling Tony during the episode what you did last year and how that compares to last year's season record. But We'll start off with the internets in the off season. The main outs include the likes of Josie Jewell, of course, Russell Wilson, the big one, Adam Troutman, Justin Simmons, and Caden Stearns. The main ins include Josh Reynolds, Cody Barton, Levi Wallace, and Brandon Jones. And draft, he took Bo Nix, 12th overall, Jonah Ellis, 76th overall, Troy Franklin, 102nd overall, as well as the likes of Chris Abrams, Aldrick Estime, Devon Veli, and Nick Gargiolo. Uh, Overall, for you, Tony, your take on the Broncos off season as a whole? Um, oh, it's a it's a difficult one. It's not been my favorite off season. I think it started from the drafts. I, I'm. It's weird because the Broncos are in a situation where sure it, it was Sean Payton is coming from last year. Last year was really sticky for the Broncos because we started off really poorly. We were we were saying uh oh, we're we're a quarterback away and a head coach away. I remember coming on here saying that we're a quarterback and a head coach away from competing again, which was the fact we've always had a half decent team and a half decent defense. So we finally got the quarterback in Russell Wilson, but that didn't really work out. And then we finally got the head coach in Sean Payton. And Sean Payton taught us how to win because the Broncos lost a lot of single possession games for the past two years. And I think last season Sean Payton taught us how to win and the things that we would normally lose on we didn't lose in the sense but then we held that 70 piece of dolphins and and it just went wrong so and you could tell sean russell wilson wasn't sean payton's guy you could tell that from day one so i was when we we had that run where russell wilson was winning games we finally beat the chiefs we beat the bills in buffalo we're thinking okay so we are a good team with russell wilson playing a certain type of way because russell wilson did not have a bad year 26 touchdowns and eight interceptions is not a bad year for a quarterback. But because he wasn't Sean Payton's guy, we got rid of him. We um, went up all that money in dead cap and we're just like, you know what? Sean Payton, here's your guy. So now my trust has to be in Sean Payton. And looking at the offseason, looking at the draft first and foremost, I'm thinking, okay, I don't think, because we had, what, the 12th pick. I was thinking, I don't think we're going to get a generational or franchise quarterback within the 12th pick. So I was thinking, you know what, let's just bolster up our defence and we go again next year. That was my take, but obviously I'm not the GM. Some things happened and we went for Bo Nix in the end. And I like Bo Nix. I've, I've, tr- I've told myself not to trust a quarterback from Oregon ever again because I put all my faith in Marcus Mariota all them years ago. And I did have my Oregon bucket hat somewhere, but I don't know where it is. But so I like Bo Nix though. That's the thing. I, I think Bo Nix is the guy and clearly Sean Payton was like, okay, this is my guy. We drafted his um, favourite receiver, Troy Franklin, to come in with him. And so we've helped him. And we have somewhat of a good offence. We've improved our offensive line. Lloyd Cushenberry is a miss in a bit. But at the end of the day, I think our O-line's okay. Our receivers are okay. Tim Patrick's coming back. And we've added Josh Reynolds from Detroit, which is I think is a good pickup. But overall, I'm worried because our defense has got worse. We've got rid of Justin Simmons, who was really, I think he was a snubber at All Pro, but he's still a Pro Bowl 
type of safety. And if not, I think he's top three safeties in the league. So even though we added Brandon Johnson, which is not really that much of a downgrade, we just haven't improved that much of a def- of our defense for me to be like, okay, I'm optimistic about this season. I'm optimistic because it's a process and now Sean Payton has his guy and we're, okay, now I have to put all my faith in Sean Payton, who is a Super Bowl winning head coach at the end of the day. But it's just a weird one because I would rather us improve the defense and then be 100% on the quarterback we have. But because I'm not 100% on the quarterback we have and our defense hasn't improved, I feel like this has been a waste of an offseason. And now we have Jarrett Stidham and we have Zach Wilson. And I know the unofficial death charts uh, got released the other day and preseason starts very soon. So we'll see who gets the most reps uh, between Bo Nix, Stidham and um, Zach Wilson. But right now it's... in the unofficial death charts, it was Stidham, who was number one, even though rookies are normally third string on the unofficial death charts. I'm not reading too much into that. But he looks like he could genuinely compete with his job for Bo Nix. I, I mean, sorry, for Zach Wilson and Jarrett Stidham, which is a scary sight because I don't want to see any of them start in the centre week one. And even if Bo Nix is not ready, what's the... Like, I've, I'm a firm believer of get your guy... If you get if you draft a quarterback in round one and he's not starting week one, unless you have a really, really good quarterback, like a Jordan Love situation. Like Jordan Love was drafted round one, but they still had Aaron Rodgers at the time. So that's why I was skeptical. But now Jordan Love is clearly a franchise quarterback. If Bo Nix is not ready to start week one, we could have just improved our defense because our rush defense was the worst defense in the league. Uh we we held a 70 piece, whether we like it or not, and I know Pasatan is the best corner in the league. But at the same time, we need help. We now need help in the secondary. Kareem Jackson's not there. It's, there's so many things we could have improved on and then probably waited for a quarterback that we're 100% sure on. So I'm, as you can tell with this run, I'm really not impressed by the offseason. But I do need to see what happens in preseason, what happens in, what's been happening in camp. I'm hearing there's been stuff going and Bo Nix is saying that, you know, the game's getting slower for him, which is good. And, and Sean Payton likes him. So my faith is in Sean Payton, but I think thinking smart and thinking about my franchise, this is not the way I would have done the off season. Do you think as well, there's always that, um, there's been some callbacks that have started week one and gone to do great things. You think about, um, recent years, Joe Burrow, and then obviously years have gone by, obviously most recently as well, even more recently than him, what was uh, CJ Stroud, but, you think about, I said this before, I might be in a part one or different teams episode, that the last three players to an MVP all sat in their first year. You think of the Mark Jackson spent two-thirds of that 2018 season behind Joe Flacco. You think of Patrick Mahomes a year behind Alex Smith taking away that one game on the final week. And then you think about Aaron Rodgers having multiple years behind Brett Favre. And we've seen Jordan Love now come into with Aaron Rodgers and he's had time to sit. Where if you look about, um, obviously, one of your callbacks to come in as well this offseason, I forgot to mention him, Zach Wilson, um, was thrust in week one straight away, and we know what's happened. It's not been the same. Or do you think maybe it's more to do with the level of quarterback more than necessarily the situation? Or do you think it is good to rest starters and to rest your future quarterback and give them that year or two to rest? Uh, I think it's good if you have a half-decent quarterback on the cards already. Like, Lamar sat because Joe Flacco is a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Uh, Jordan Love sat because Aaron Rodgers is Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Mahomes is it's probably the only example, but Alex Smith was still good at the time, even though he did go on to... Um, I remember they rested him for that a game against Tennessee, it was, and he lost to Marcus Mariota. And the game that Patrick Mahomes played, he torched us. But you could see... In that game where he torched us in Denver, like, okay, yeah, Alex Smith, you're, you're done. This guy, Patrick Mahomes, is the real deal. You can see that from day one. So if they started Patrick Mahomes week one, I don't think it's any different. I think s- sitting a quarterback does help. Like, there's always benefits to sitting a quarterback and not thrusting them in straight away. But I think it's the level of play. CJ Stroud looks like a stud, right? And CJ Stroud looks like one of the best quarterbacks. He looks like he can win his division right now. And he won a playoff game as a rookie. Like, it is possible. And out of all the quarterbacks from this draft, I think Bo Nix is the most polished. I won't say he's the best, but I think he's the most polished because I think he had the most games um, at Oregon and in, in college. So I think he's the most polished. So I don't... If he does beat out Zach Wilson and Jarrett Stidham to the um, QB1 spot, I think he will start week one. And I won't be 
like annoyed about it but normally the fact that it's they're spitting reps and it's not a guarantee like Caleb Williams is practically a guarantee to start week one um Drake May practically starting week one like both and I'm not saying those quarterbacks are better than Bo Nix but if you draft in the first round I, I really think they have to like you're doing that for a reason if not you can because you can find quarterbacks it's not all the time, but you can find quarterbacks in the third, fourth round. Like Dak Prescott was like a fourth round quarterback. I'm not saying Dak Prescott's the greatest, but he's a, he's a starter and he will start in most NFL teams. So if you're going to get a guy and you want that guy to start in week one, they've got to be ready if you thrust him in. So I don't think it's that much of a like letdown if he doesn't start week one. But I I would like to see Bo Nick start week one. It's it's going to be really interesting in the preseason game against the Colts to see how he reads defenses, how what he's like, what he's like in the pocket. I think he'll be better in a sense because he won't take as many sacks as Russell Wilson and that will please Sean Payton. And Sean Payton's a good offensive mind. So all he has to do, if if there's one person that has to check down and do the check downs and maybe go in a deep ball with Cortland Sutton or or his favourite target, Troy Franklin, who he knows, Bo Nix could possibly do that. So I'm not too worried in a sense, but because our team is just still a bit, feels incomplete at the moment, that's that's where my worry is. Yeah, and looking at the um, report that you mentioned, at the moment he's down as um, quarterback three in the depth chart. Uh, at the moment, it's uh, Jarvis Stidham, who's number one in the depth chart, and then Zach Wilson, number two. So it's right now, it, You, I, I think personally, you won't see him week one, but I think you'll see him starting in week 15, week 16. I think maybe he'll give Jarvis Stidham a chance if he's performing well well in training and practice. They may think, well, give him a shot. He's earned his right to start. And then say week two or three, he's struggling. They'll then bring probably Zach Wilson in or Bo Nix in. And then that, I think that's how you'll eventually see Bo Nix coming in. I think for originally being the third choice, but then I think through Stidham and Wilson's lack of quality, I think that will let you'll then see Bo Nix come in. And I think that will be when he won't look back. But whether he'll be NFL great, NFL average player, we don't know yet. But I think, I think we will see him at some point. I just don't believe it's week one. I do believe week one will be most likely still or Zach Wilson, in my opinion. But then preseason comes out, sometimes players can really impress in like a Gannon game. Say, if Bonus comes in and torches whoever you play in one of the preseason games and gets 400 yards, four touchdowns, I think that could then almost elevate him from QB3 to QB1. I think that might be how he does. But I think otherwise, I think it'll be more likely some point in the season, one of the callback struggles, so next is time to come in. Yeah, I think, I think that's how it will work. I just want I just I just want Sean Payne to find his guy because he was clearly even though Russell Wilson was somewhat annoying, we won games and we were on a run with Russ where we were beating good teams and we were like, okay, we could possibly like we're in the hunt for the playoffs. We went from holding a seventy piece and being practically the worst team in the NFL to being, oh, hold on a second, we can we can make a playoff run. And then he and then after Sean Payton got rid of him with like what, three games to go and we beat the Chargers, but beating the Chargers is not it's not hard and Sean Payton was like no this is not my guy so I have to put my faith in Sean Payton and when my logic is telling me maybe we could have done this to make ourselves a better team for the future I've just got to put my faith in Sean Payton and we'll see we'll see what he decides but I think these preseason games will really show if if Bonex has a really good preseason then maybe just maybe he might start week one and then if it's not working out or he throws a couple picks just throw Jarrett instead of in for a couple of games, or Zach Wilson, do you know what I mean? Them type of things. But it, it really does seem like Bo Nix is his guy. So we'll, we'll see. We'll see. You, you mentioned Sean Payton then. And of course, the jury's out on him so far as a Bronco head coach because we all know what he did in New Orleans. You know, won him a Super Bowl, turned them from a laughing stock to perennial playoff appearances, perennial contender for Super Bowl. You know, they made, obviously, they should have really made a second. Super Bowl with that game against the Rams. We all know what happened there. And, you know, had a, a lot of winning seasons. And, you know, you come into a Broncos team where, you know, you have the disaster year one, Russell Wilson. He comes in Russell Wilson's second year, of course, last season. I, I must say, I, I wasn't that impressed with him. I think there were certain games I watched where it looked like he was a bit sort of, of a dinosaur in his thinking. And some of, some of his sort of the way he coached some of the games and schemed certain plays, it just, it just felt a little bit to me like um, he wasn't capable of change, you know, a bit like, you know, Arsene Wenger towards the end of his time at Arsenal just seemed like 
he wasn't willing to change his, his sort of mindset. I, I don't know. For me, what watching a Sean Payton last year, it didn't look anywhere near to what I remember watching a Sean Payton side, and it just it just wasn't like been great. What's your thoughts of him? Because you you obviously watch him and the Broncos a lot more than myself and other non Broncos fans would, especially non AFC West teams that we support. How, you benched before that you've got to trust in him, and I'm guessing you're fully on board with him. But it was take me on a mixed first year. It's called a lot of drama off the field as well with the Hackett comments and all that. So yeah, what was your take on Sean Payton's first season and going into this year? I'm skeptical. I'm only trusting him because. He's a he's a Super Bowl winning head coach, and I'm me. That's the only reason I said why I'm trusting. I'm skeptical because we went from Nathaniel Hackett, and that Nathaniel Hackett season was insane. Like we went from our head coach not calling out plays, which I just think is insane, and we went we so we went from that, and then we went from the Nathaniel Hackett comments were saying that we're going to change everything differently. And from what we saw with that season last season was that the culture and the way the Broncos were running as a football team just wasn't great. So I trusted Sean Payton because he's an old school coach. He knows how to do it and he's done it before and he's implementing. If it's not broken, don't fix it. Yes, you are right in a sense that you have to get with the times, but the Broncos were in a situation where we were losing, we were losing games we shouldn't have lost. I remember the games against the Commanders. I think it was last season against the Commanders. I think we lost to them at home and it was a game, again, we just shouldn't have lost. And then even a game last season where I think it was against the commanders where we've hell Mary, we've gone down and then we just couldn't convert the two point conversion. And I'm just like, okay, like we, we've done the hard part. How did we, how can we not do the easy part? And so, but that again, that could be down to Russ. That could be down to Sean Payton. But then we, then we had some good wins, some good wins that we didn't normally have before. We finally beat the chiefs for the first time ever. Finally beat Patrick Mahomes for the first time ever, which was great. And we beat them convincingly. It wasn't like, oh, we just beat them in the last play. Patrick Mahomes had a really bad day through like multiple interceptions. He was wasn't on the field as much. And we beat them by a half decent amount. We went into Buffalo, got the job done. We went on like some five game win streak. I'm thinking, okay, like Sean, we're rolling. I, I get what you're saying. I get what we're doing. Even though he we became like the the um the New Orleans Broncos, like we had so many players from New Orleans, but at the same time, I could see what he was doing. But I'm a bit sceptical because the NFL game is changing and you see a lot of younger head coach with new ideas. And not even younger head coach in a sense because Andy Reid's not young, but he he's innovative. He can implement different things and he can keep it going. But it's like Sean Payton wants to... I feel like Sean Payton, in his sense, because he came into a... Not a bad roster. I think he came into a team that was had such bad coaching. He had to build us from the ground up. And I remember a lot of in his press conferences, he was like, we've got to teach these guys not how to win games, how to not lose games first. But he was like, before I teach these Broncos how to win games, we need to teach them. And he was right, because a lot of the games we lost, it, it wasn't down to the team being better than us. It was down to the team. It was down to us. It was down to silly mistakes. It was down to silly penalties and just not executing the basics. So I agreed with him in that sense. But then after I'm like, then we were started losing games, like losing to the Patriots on Christmas Day after the runs we had. And I was just like, that was a big... If we won that game, Russell... I'm not saying Russell Wilson would still be the quarterback, but then we're in the playoff hunt. And then the whole dropping Russell Wilson with three games to go maybe doesn't happen. And then maybe we see how he stack up to good teams in a playoff situation. Because we have not reached the playoff since we've won it. And I would like to see us in a playoff game again, you know. Like, it would, it would just be nice. So, I am in with Sean Payton. But at the same time, I'm very sceptical because he's done a lot of things his way. And if it doesn't go out, we have to put the blame on him. But at the same time, I kind of get him because he needs to break us, like, break us down from the, and build us up from, again. So that's why I'm, I'm in. I'm not fully in, but I'm in because I trust him and he had the credentials to show for it. Do you think as well the fact that, you know, his best, his best period as head coach was the Drew Brees era, and of course, a guy that was written off a bit with his time with the Chargers, the, a lot of injury problems, and you know, again, it's another guy that he's chosen in Bo Nix that you know, wasn't it wasn't necessarily seen as a, as a top ten draft pick, and he wasn't seen as the like the top quarterback of the class. And I think that if, if you find the guy he likes, likely to Drew Brees from the Chargers to um to New New Orleans, do you think as well that 
is almost like, even though on paper you think of Caleb Williams or you know, someone else like JJ McCarthy may, may be a better quarterback, if it's his guy, it makes all the difference in the world. And that will obviously hopefully work for you guys. Yeah, 100%. Because I didn't, there's a lot of quarterbacks, watch, I didn't really want JJ. I remember we were uh, talking a lot with JJ McCarthy pre draft, and I was like, please, no. But if Sean Payton's got his guy, and they said they were really happy, like from from what we could tell, it, it seemed they're really happy with the Bonex pick. And the fact that we even picked up Trey Franklin as well. So to give him that familiarity of oh cool, like I would like to see that partnership as well, because you can see the, the partnerships between like CJ Stroud and Tank Bell, two rookies. But then if you're gonna get a rookie and rookie partnership, at least get someone he was playing with at Oregon. So that that helps him in a sense. It makes it more easier for him. So he really trusts him and it feels like if there's one head coach that's going to surround his quarterback and is good at quarterback play, it's Sean Payton. So I trust him in that sense. And that's the only reason that's the why I trust him. But we'll see. Absolutely. And speaking of which, we are going to now head to our final section, which is going to be our win-loss tie segment. So for those listening here that don't know the format by now, every fan who comes on predicts their team's record by going through each game and answering with a win-loss tie prediction. So... I mentioned at the start of the episode, you did come on for last year's season preview. So, the Broncos in 2023, you went, um, let me get the stats up now. So, you went, I had it a minute ago, eight and nine you went. Can you remember what your prediction was a year ago? Probably 10 and seven. So, you went for uh, 10 and seven, bang on. So, yeah. yeah, only a couple of games off being right this last year. Yeah, that that's I think ten and seven was well, and really and truly, if we actually look at the Broncos and games we should have won, we should never should have lost to the Patriots, never should have lost to the Commanders. It should have been ten and seven. It should have been ten and seven, but eight and nine is not too. Like it's quite close. I think I predicted like our losses to the Dolphins and stuff like that, and one to the Chiefs. I did predict that we would beat the Chiefs though, and I was right about that. You did, yeah, that is right. Well, wasn't that more because you thought we might rest players? Was that was the reason, wasn't it? No, because we didn't. We we played the Chiefs. Um, it wasn't during when they were resting players. We played the oh, Chiefs I quite early. I just, I, I just thought like it's, it's about time. Like, it's yeah, about time we finally beat Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> so that that was the only reason as to why I predicted it. But but we finally we finally done it. I don't know why I thought it was a Week 18 clash, but looking at this now, looking at the schedule, um, it was weird. It was Week Eight. My memories yeah, yeah. completely passed me by. <laughs> Yeah, I think we got them week 18 this time around, I think. I think we got them late this time around. You have, yeah, and I believe it was late on as well. It was actually, it was the thing of mid-December when you played them and almost beat them a couple of years before as well. Yes, at our head, yes, yes. We always knew it was that long. I, I don't know why I thought... I didn't know it was that early on in the season. 24 to 9, it's... um. I have to watch back that game because that game is complete. Just it was it was when the, it was when do you remember like at the start of the season where the Chiefs so they lost their first game to Lions, the, yeah, Detroit, and then it was it was when like before they went on a run at, towards the end of the season, it was like oh are the Chiefs like are the Chiefs not good like oh yeah, do you remember that stage of the season where, like the Chiefs not good and then we were like oh you know this is what happens when you lose Tyreek blah 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 but then obviously they go on to win the Super Bowl because they have Patrick Mahomes. But yeah, it was it was during that time. So um, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad we did it because it was a convincing win. It was a really convincing win. Mm. Looking at now, it was 24 to nine, which is um, yeah a very um, poor day for Mahomes. By looks by looking at the things, it looks like he got no touchdowns at all in that game. Um, it looked like you gave them a good a good run around. Um, week one, um, you're on the road to the Seattle Seahawks. Win, loss, or tie. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm going to say loss only because we've gone week, I've seen us week one on the road with a better team going to Seattle and, and lose so I'm going to say loss uh, week two um, you would think you'd be playing Russell Wilson again in week two uh, when you play the Pittsburgh Steelers at home Steelers at home I think that's a loss okay so week three is a road game against the Buccaneers I think we can win that because I don't. Want to, I don't want to start. I'm, I'm saying next. I don't want to start 0 three, but I think we can win that. 
Well, so far, um, looking at our part one predictions with Charlie, so far you've got the exact same three results so far. So I'm intrigued to see how your record compares to Charlie's and um, you know, and how how different the record looks. Um, week four, you're on the road again, this time against Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. I think we lose that one. Okay. So week five, you are at home against the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, we win, win. We need to win that one because we have a poor record against the Raiders. Right, it's still exactly the same as Charlie's at the moment. Um, next up, you take the Chargers on at home. Uh, win. Okay. Um, so week seven is the Sean Baton Bowl as you travel to New Orleans Saints to take on them at the Superdome. I think we can win that one. I honestly think we can win that one. Because I think New Orleans, their quarterback situation isn't the greatest. And even though their team, like, the New Orleans are just slowly declining. And because they're in um, the NFC South, where no one really, like, pays attention to, in a sense, because everyone's focused on the Falcons right now, I really think we can do them. And I think Sean Payton, I think they've got that marked in the calendar. So, yeah, I'll say we're going to win that one. Yeah, I mean, I, I said it before in another episode that I think the Saints are just a scream, just a seven-win season. It's just, yeah. It's just, and after we've got um, one of your colleagues coming on the show, Jay Lawrence, to preview the Saints season, um, we'll be, I think, recording it at some point next week. So, yeah, I'm going to tell him that when I get there as well, when I speak to him. But, um, yeah, it just, they just to me, they just seem like the most obvious seven-win team I've ever seen out of all the teams this season in the NFL. Um, week eight, you're taking on, at home, the Carolina Panthers. Win, loss, or tie? Uh, win. Okay. And week nine... You are on the road in what's a tough back-to-back stretch now uh, against the Baltimore Ravens. Oh, loss. Yeah, that is um, yeah, that's one of the hardest games for whoever you are, whether you're a 12-win team, whether you're a 4-win team. I think it's always always a tough place to go in Baltimore, that, that stadium. Um, but week 10, you're on the road again, this time against the Chiefs. Yeah, loss. I'll be realistic. Yeah, no, that is that is totally fair. Um, week eleven, you're at home again, but this time against the Falcons. Oh, Coco Chains. Um, win. Who got signed for Cousins? That is the first one of the whole things of our way. You've got off from a different scoreline to Charlie. Charlie went for a loss there. Went five and five. The exact same win- wins and losses from the first ten games. But that is the first where you've gone for a different answer. So. Um, Oh, that's just me being optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's just me being optimistic. I, I would like, I think it's at home, maybe we could do something a bit of Falcons. I, I doubt the Falcons can come to mile high and really press themselves against us. I feel like it, we, we can make it a good game and maybe the mile high crowd and the, the um, altitude helps us in a sense. But that's if I'm betting it on altitude, we will probably lose. But that's just me being optimistic. Yeah, fair enough. Um... Week 12, you're on the road uh, this time against the Las Vegas Raiders. Ooh, Vegas. We'll probably lose. Okay. Um, week 13 is a home game against the Cleveland Browns. Win. Okay. So, week 14 is by week. So, week 15, you're at home again, this time against the Colts. Uh, I want to say win, but no, I'll say win. I'll say win. I'm being optimistic. Hey, love it. Love it. Um, week 16, your penultimate road game of the season. You take on the LA Chargers. You know what? Can I swap my... Uh, I'll say win for this and I'll swap a loss for the Colts. Okay, so that means... Um, the loss of Colts will make you seven and seven, and then the win against the Chargers makes you eight and seven. Okay, um, so week seventeen, you're on the road to the Cincinnati Bengals. Oh, loss. Yeah, that is totally understandable. I think that'll be a good once again. And then finally, week eighteen, you go to the or you host, sorry, the Chiefs. Win because they've won the AFC West and we're resting players. And they're resting players. 
Okay, so yeah, that means you'll go nine and eight. Um, so that's quite a respectable season. A um, bit of a sort of bit of a hit, hit and miss in terms of is that making the playoffs? Is that not making the playoffs? Bit of a tetchy sort of line. Could we go one? Could make you in? Could get you in? You could just miss out. Um, but where do you, do you think that nine eight record gets you into the playoffs, or do you think you just missed out on the playoffs? Uh, in the AFC, I don't think nine and eight gets us. I think the AFC is just so stacked at the moment. I think even the NFC, yeah, we'll probably win a division with that. <laughs> but uh, in the AFC, I don't think it does. But I don't mind. I think our objective as a franchise is to do better than last season, and to do better than last season, which we were what eight and nine means nine and eight. So I don't know. We were eight and nine. yeah, yeah, we were eight and nine. So it's to do nine and eight, and I think that's that's the objective. I don't think we're a ten and seven team. I don't think we're eleven and six team. I don't, I don't think we're. I think our our ceiling is probably nine and eight or maybe ten and seven at best. But honestly, with that schedule, the schedule is not looking great. I think those AFC North games we have, especially on the road as well, is not looking great as well. So I think as long as I think everyone's objective is to do better, one better than last season. So nine and eight is pretty respectable. Yeah, I think it's once again it's progress as well. Um, one win more than the previous year. Um, before we do go, um, of course, we're switching sports here. You spent a lot of time through your work at the Euros recently. Um, how was that experience? Yeah, it was great. I was um, out in Germany for the whole tournament, and it was great until the final, watching England lose. Uh, I feel like I've, I've watched both my teams, Nigeria and England, both lose in the national finals. Oh, so of course, really, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, maybe maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the problem because it, it's it's not been a great year for me. I think tournament wise, experiencing the whole tournament and being out in Germany or um, being out in the Ivory Coast was great. But watching finals and being optimistic and then losing has just not been great for me. So hopefully this year I won't watch any. I, I'm probably not going to go to any finals for a long time. I think I should just like not because I didn't go to the FA Cup final and we won that. So I think I might not just go to finals and just watch them and stay at home and maybe I'm the curse. Maybe it's me. Maybe. I always think about like I've been to five Dolphins games and they've lost every single time. All the ones oh, I've seen gosh. And so, yeah, it's like, I mean, I've seen us play, you know, the Bengals and the Eagles. I've seen us play some good teams, but um, the Jag one in London was probably the one where we should have won. But, yeah. um, you know, we lost to the Bengals. The one where Tua got almost died. You know, you've got the we played, the played the Vikings. They were good that year, you know, and then the Eagles um, last season who were good at that point. Uh, I haven't seen us play the char- the, not Chargers, the uh, Cardinals this year. So I'm hoping that will be the one where I do break the trend because, yeah, it's getting a lot of um, my friends who are Dolphins fans that keep telling me I shouldn't be going to games anymore because... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Kind really... of Murray to Marvin Harrison Jr. Not yet, oh. you know. <laughs> well, if that happens to me, I think I might have to call it a day at that point and just go to like because I, I think I was zero and two. I was I saw Brady go zero and two in live games. I saw him play. So I think I'm probably a bad luck charm for him. But I think yeah, if I lose an, another yeah, goal, well, game, Tom Brady lose twice. Maybe it's you. <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's not been a great track record. But I'm hoping that um, yeah, hopefully this year that changes. No, hopefully, hopefully. No, yeah. look forward. That'll be good. It'll be good. To yeah. Know. I think the Cardinals is kind of a sure one. Like, if I go to a Broncos game this year, I'm going to try and... I was looking at the Chargers at home game. Mm. Or or maybe the Falcons. I think the Falcons will be... Because the Falcons, you never know. That's like, oh, they're a half-decent yeah. team. Well, we're a half-decent team. Like, it depends. It depends how the first three games go. If we're 0-3, I'm just going to be like, yeah, you know what, Denver can wait. But if we're 1-2... and two, Owen Free or respectable Owen Free, we'll see. But I think, regardless, you just got to go out there and experience it, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, when I went there last time, I really experienced the Florida Keys more than Miami. So I'm looking forward to actually exploring. I'm there for a week, get to see the actual main bits of Miami. I'm looking forward to that. Um, going to Hard Rock again. And yeah, and I'm going. I went with friends last time, but my seats were nowhere near where they were sat. But this time, I'm next to friends, uh, next to my girlfriend as well. So it's going to be, um, yeah, with people I. Um, also I know well and also I tend when I did the travelling I did a lot of vlogging so I was doing a lot of games there and it was the case where sometimes you're vlogging and focusing so much on getting good content that you're not actually taking in the game you're watching yeah. so um, yeah, I look forward I'm doing no I might do a couple of TikTok videos or something like that 
but I'm not going to be there vlogging every single snap or like I have them before, them before. So yeah, I look forward to that. And yeah, hopefully we'll then um, come away with the win. Dolphins fight, mu fight, Dolphins fight music is playing in the background. I think that would be just <laughs> yeah an amazing experience. I know, mate. I'm looking for. I hope. Hopefully, I'll get to see it on Insta. I'll be looking forward to it. Yeah, it, it'll, it'll go on Insta good. at some point. It definitely, yeah. you'll, you'll find on Insta. I think it's the last weekend of October. So I'm going to hopefully get the three London games done media wise, and then then go next week, following week, go to um, yeah, go to Miami and, and hopefully see them win. Oh, that'll be good, man. That'll be good. Yeah. Can't wait. Can't wait for it. And that is a great way to end this podcast for today, our part two of our Denver Broncos series. So thanks again to Charlie for part one and thank you, Tony, for coming on for part two. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Uh, always a pleasure, mate. We'll have you on, I'm sure, during the season at some point as well to see how the Broncos are doing. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be a good podcast, not me being the press and wanting to feel <laughs> Sean Payton, but, you know, we'll see. And for those as well who aren't familiar with your work, um, let them know how they can find you on socials. Uh, yeah, all, all my socials are my name, so at T-O-N-I-A-F-O-K-E, -E, Tony Afoke. And I will I will post more because I, I don't post that much and it's really bad at me, but I will. I've told myself this season I will post more. So, yeah, well, Tony Afoke and all the socials. Great stuff. So do give and follow if you haven't already. There's some great stuff on Talk Sport, And, um, yeah, looking forward to what the work you do again this year in multiple sports. Uh, but yeah, that is where we'll end this Denver Broncos 2024 season preview with myself, Andy Davis, and our guest today, Tony Apoke, and also Charlie Grace in part one. And we'll see you guys for our next team season preview. Take care.